On the 3rd of September 2004, the siege at the Beslan No. 1 school was brought to an end. Amid the chaos, students, parents and teachers held captive attempted to flee. With aims of ending the Second Chechen War, the captors used students as human shields as a means to achieve their goals. In the end, over 330 people lost their lives, many of them being students. In today's video, we will cover the events of the Beslan school siege and the failings of the authorities to prevent both the attack and the massive loss of life. It is perhaps helpful to start with a brief explanation of the situation in Chechnya. Following the dissolution of the Soviet Union, Chechen nationalists sought independence from the Russian Federation. The First Chechen War saw Russia engage in indiscriminate bombings of civilians and the rise of Chechen terror attacks against Russian civilians, including those led by Shamil Basayev. Even after the war, the region was beset by warlords and Islamist extremists, but independence seemed to have been achieved. In 1999, in response to apparent terror attacks, the Russian army returned and flattened the capital of Grozny. Chechen forces fled to the mountains and launched guerrilla warfare, whilst terror attacks were launched against Russian civilians. Planes and public places were bombed as the separatist rebellion mutated into an Islamic campaign of violence. In 2002, Shamil Basayev organized the siege and hostage taking of a Moscow theater. In the end, 132 hostages were killed. The authorities were only able to bring an end to the siege after they used an unidentified gas. This gas, to this day, has still not been identified. The response was seen as poor and was followed up with supposed cover-ups as to the effects of the gas. Basayev continued to target Russian civilians, with a number of bombings, notably of planes, public places and government buildings. On the morning of the 1st of September 2004, students, teachers and parents at the Beslan No. 1 school were celebrating the start of a new school year. But operating from a hidden camp a few kilometres from Beslan, 32 terrorists of various nationalities and ethnicities launched their attack. Most were Chechen, with having lost their family in the two wars. There were also two Saudis and two Anglo-Algerians, though there is little information about most of the assailants. There were 30 men and two women, led by Ruslan Kachabarov, nicknamed the Colonel. The group was called the Riohad Solahin Brigade, with aims of creating an Islamic state in the Caucasus. Armed with Kalashnikovs, anti-tank weapons and explosive vests, they arrived in two groups aboard a stolen police vehicle and a military truck. Initially, they were believed by those at the school to be Russian special forces carrying out some kind of drill. That was until they started shooting. The group herded those present into the school building. Some managed to escape, whilst one adult and 12 children managed to hide in a boiler room, able to make their escape at a later time. The vast majority were held in the sports halls, with some selected to be held in a classroom. In the sports hall, the windows were destroyed as to limit the effectiveness of any potential gas attack by Russian security forces. In place of glass, children were made to act as human shields, stood in the windows. Hanging from the basketball hoops and draped over chairs, explosives were laid in a ring around the hostages. Trip wires and mines were placed all around the buildings as to deter potential attempts to rescue the hostages. Some of the militants stood on dead man switches, meaning that if they were killed or left where they were stood, explosives would be detonated. A handful of hostages were executed for refusing to kneel or for not following orders. What's more, the hostages were put on hunger strikes, that is to say, they were denied food and water. Those held in the classrooms were hand-picked, being the men thought to pose the biggest threat to the militants. Held with the two female terrorists who had their vests reportedly remotely detonated by the colonel. The hostages who managed to survive the explosions were shot and their bodies were dumped outside the school. The initial response by the Russian authorities was to cordon off the school and whilst a significant military presence was established, there was little in the way of emergency services to assist. By the afternoon, the authorities estimated that there were no more than 200 hostages, 
A far cry from the over 1,000 that were actually being held. From the family members outside knowing full well that there were many more, it was an outrageous underestimation. Figures would increase as the siege progressed, albeit slowly. As for the dialogue between the authorities and the terrorists, progression was slow. It was reported that there was not one single communication line from the terrorists, an indication of a lack of organisation and the different aims amongst the group. They did threaten to execute 50 hostages in response for each of their own killed. It was only with the prompting of one of the hostages did the group finally give the details of whom they wished to speak to. On the 2nd of September, Ruslan Aushev, former president of the Ingushetia region, was called in to act as a negotiator. He was noted for his vocal opposition to the First Chechen War. He was able to arrange the release of 26 hostages, those being nursing mothers and any babies. A videotaped message from Basayev was also handed to Aushev, detailing demands that included the region of an independent Chechnya. In exchange for this, Basayev would admit his role in the terror bombings that sparked the Second Chechen War. Aushev's role, however, would be omitted from official accounts of the day, and he would play no further part in the siege. Later in the afternoon, grenades were thrown at security force vehicles, with some shots made by the terrorists, bringing the day's negotiations to an end. By the second day without any food or water, many of the hostages were beginning to struggle. Children and adults alike were beginning to faint. Some resorted to drinking their own urine. Children who fainted were splashed with water to bring them back around, only to be brought back to the hall. Some stripped down to their underwear due to the heat. Those who were called upon by the group to negotiate were reportedly prevented in doing so by the Russian authorities. Anna Politkovskaya, a journalist who assisted with the negotiations in the previous Moscow theatre siege, was reportedly poisoned by the Russian FSB en route to assist with the siege at Beslan. By the third day, a number of Chechen politicians and leading figures were called upon to assist with the negotiations, but before any such people were able to arrive, the storming of the school was in full swing. At around 1pm, a deal was made to allow the removal of some of the bodies outside the school. As the paramedics arrived, explosions were heard within the sports hall. The roof of the hall was seen to be on fire, but to this day, there is a dispute as to what triggered the fire. One theory put forward was that a Russian sniper killed a terrorist on a dead man switch, triggering an explosion. Another theory is that an RPG was fired into the school from outside causing the fire. The final is that the militant group detonated their explosives either purposefully to confuse the authorities or by accident. Either way, the roof of the hall collapsed onto the hostages at around 1.30pm. In response to this, the Russian special forces breached a wall to the hall, creating a way for the hostages to escape. During the chaos, the militant terrorist group started shooting at the fleeing hostages. Some accounts detail how some of the Russian special forces were not prepared for the breach. Some were not even wearing body armor, and yet, still attempting to shield children with their own bodies. Some of the hostages struggled to escape, exhausted on account of being denied food and water. Against the backdrop of media silence and fears of a repeat of the theater siege led to many locals to take up arms and attempt to play a part in the rescue. But this only added to the confusion of the situation, leading to shots fired in the wrong directions at times. One of these armed civilians is known to have died during the fighting. During the firefight, some of the militants took hostages to different areas of the school, escaping the inferno in the sports hall. Again, the hostages were placed near windows as human shields. Around 110 hostages were dragged to the cafeteria, and of these, only four would survive. It was only two hours after the fighting began that the fire brigade was called to deal with the fires. Even when they arrived, they were ill-prepared and unable to control the fires. As the wounded and ill managed to escape, there were not enough ambulances to take them to hospital. Many had to make their way in civilian cars. After around 12 hours, the fighting was over. In all, 334 hostages were dead. 186 of them were children.
All but one of the terrorists were killed, the sole survivor being Nopashi Kuliev. One notable criticism about the authorities' handling of the situation was the disproportionate firepower used. Thermobaric rockets were reportedly fired, devices that have been described as flamethrowers. These rockets rob an area of oxygen, create a pressure wave, and produce a fireball. It was reported that both a helicopter and a tank fired rockets and shells into the school. Heavy caliber machine guns mounted on armored personnel carriers too returned fire into the school. What followed was an attempt by the Russian authorities and President Putin to frame the attack as part of the global war on terror. Rather than attribute the issue to the years of war and instability in Chechnya, it was framed as Islamist violence and nothing more. Attempts were made to inflate the number of Arab militants when most were actually from the region. Putin denounced the weakness of regional leaders for allowing the attack to even take place. He painted the attack as an international attempt to weaken Russia. As is often the case during the war on terror, the state sought to expand police powers and pass new anti-terrorism laws. On a wider point, the ongoing war could be reframed from a matter of Chechen independence to one of a legitimate counter-terrorism action. In 2006, an internal investigation concluded that the Russian authorities made no mistakes during the siege and that moderate forces within Chechnya were to blame. For the families of the dead and for those survivors, the official narrative was not acceptable. Between 2008 and 2011, 409 people, both survivors and the families of the dead, brought seven complaints to the European Court of Human Rights. In 2017, the courts ruled that the Russian authorities could and should have done more to prevent the siege and the high number of casualties inflicted. In August of 2004, the Ministry of Internal Affairs sent a telegram about the movement of militants near the border of North Ossetia. It recommended an increase in security at public places such as schools. On the day, the sole border guard was kidnapped by the militants, and only one unarmed police officer was near the school at the time. The court found that during the operation to release the hostages, those in command of the situation, quote, suffered a lack of formal leadership, resulting in serious flaws in decision-making and coordination with other relevant agencies. The court found that the victim's right to life had been infringed with the indiscriminate use of weapons such as tank cannon, grenade launchers, and flamethrowers. There was no accountability or accounting for the weapons used during the siege, and that the authorities' use of these weapons contributed to the death toll of the hostages. The court awarded the victims 3 million euros in compensation. However, the verdict was not enforceable. The Beslan school siege is both a tragedy and a horrific example of indiscriminate violence. The hostage takers targeted children and used them as human shields. The situation was delicate, and whilst some hostages were released, the disparate demands of the terrorists and the seeming reluctance of the authorities to engage in negotiations made a peaceful resolution difficult. The authorities' use of destructive weapons and poor organization led to the desperate attempts to rescue as many as they could. Beslan highlights the need for taking the risk of terrorism seriously and responding to credible intelligence appropriately. Yet it also serves as a warning as to the power plays of government who seek to use such events to further their own goals. It is yet another example of the cycles of violence, and in the end, 300 men, women and children paid the price, victims of a long-standing conflict and escalation of violence. Mm -hmm.